Um, when you're ready, sir, let's get underway. I'm ready. Go! Hi, I'm Tobias Carla. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My very special guest today is Michael Mobison. He's the Director of Research at Blue Mountain Capital Management. He's been an adjunct professor at Columbia for more than 25 years, earning multiple awards for doing so. He's the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Santa Fe Institute, and he's a prolific re- uh, researcher and writer on all things investment. I can't wait to talk to him. We're going to talk to him right after this. <laughs> Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm great, Toby. How are you? Uh, so much the better for, for chatting to you right now. I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this conversation. Um, I've got, you can see, you may be able to see in my, my bookshelf back there, many of your books are, are on prominent display. Um, I thought we'd start with uh, the book that you fo- first co-wrote with Alfred Rappaport, um, uh, expectations investing. So the, I think the story about how you came to write that is quite interesting. So could you, would you let us know how, how did that come about? Well, I'll first say that I was a, a liberal arts major in college. I studied government. I'd never taken a business class. Well, I, I, I take that back. I took business uh, accounting for non-business majors when I was a senior and got a, a C plus on the course <laughs> out, of the, out of the gracious heart of the professor. Um, so I really had no business experience. And so I came onto Wall Street um, in the mid 1980s, uh, having no idea what was going on, and and really there were so many old wives' tales and rules of thumb. I guess to some degree we still have those, but but that was certainly the uh, the main thing I confronted. And then uh, in the late 1980s, uh, one of my uh, trainee classmates actually handed me a, cap- a copy of Alfred Rappaport's first book called Creating Shareholder Value. So that was published originally in 1986. And for me, that was my epiphany. <clears throat> the light bulb went off. And there are three things in particular he talked about in that book that have really become the centerpiece of, of my thinking all along my professional career. The first is something, Toby, you've written a lot about and you know a lot about is that it's not accounting numbers, but it's cash that ultimately drives the value of businesses. And so how do we think about that as, as value investors in general? Second is, and I think we, we you know, I, I still think we do a poor job of this, is he argued that competitive strategy and valuation really shouldn't be separate. They should be joined at the hip, which is to say, um, you know, this litmus test of a good strategy is that it creates value and that you can't really do a thoughtful valuation without understanding the economics of a business and, and the industry. And then the third and final thing was chapter, a chapter that was, edic- it was, it was aimed at corporate executives, but it was called Stock Market Signals to Management. And the argument was, hey, CEO, you, um, what is key, crucial is what's priced into your stock in terms of expectations. And for you to deliver excess returns in the stock market, it has to be uh, consistent with a revision in expectations. So this idea of e- the markets being expectations machine. So I immediately started writing about this very enthusiastically as an analyst. And by the way, that it was a little bit out there. I mean, it was a little bit quasi-academic, but I had, I had a, a couple of key executives in particular and investors who were supportive. Um, one I would mention, by the way, is Bill Steeritz, who was the CEO at the time of Ralston Purina. He's prominently uh, featured in Will Thorndike's book, The Outsiders. And getting the sort of imprimatur from someone like Steeritz really was an attaboy for a guy like me who was young at the time. <clears throat> and so then I, I uh, you know, collaborated, just I would talk to Rappaport from time to time. And then in the late 1990s, he sat down and said, hey, you know, uh, a lot of these ideas do make sense for investors. Uh, would you like to collaborate on a book where we take those core principles and apply them specifically to investors? So that was, uh, you know, we wrote that in 1999. By the way, it, was, it actually launched on <laughs> September 10th. Just think about this. September 10th, 
2001. So the day before a national tragedy in the middle of a three-year bear market. So the timing of the release was not ideal, but um, it was just an it was just an awesome project. And 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 it, you know just being able to work with someone who's your mentor and uh, you know someone for I've I've just such deep respect. Um, and now Rappaport, I still he's in San Diego. He's not too far from you, and you know, I still talk to him frequently and just such a thrill and just been such a, a huge influence in my life not only professionally but even personally so that's that's the expectations investing story one of the really powerful ideas in expectations investing and it's built right into the the title there is the idea that you can see implied from the market price the expectations for a business so we, we we've got historical data on uh, earnings and cash flow and growth rates and then you can take a forward look at what the market price implies and then your job as an analyst is to determine whether that is uh, a fair uh, expectation or not and i think that one of the nice things about it is it does a really good job of tying together what you know that that buffett would never allow them to be separated but they are often separated the growth and value for investors so can you just talk a little bit about that that process how you come up with the expectation and uh, the mechanics of that that undertaking yeah. 100 percent and you know there are a lot of people who <clears throat> have negative things to say about discounting i think everyone agrees that discounted cash flow is intellectually the correct way to value all financial assets so you get very little pushback on that but people get you know the devils in the details about how models can lead to whatever values assuming whatever assumptions you make and so the first beautiful thing about expectation investing is actually reverse engineers the process one thing we know for sure is the price and then you basically are asking a simple question what has to happen for this price to make sense so mechanically, what you would do is say, uh, can I do a good job or a, a reasonable job of trying to understand the consensus expectations that are built into this price in terms of and, you know, value drivers, right? So sales, growth rates, operating profit margins, capital intensity, and understand what has to happen for that price to make sense. So now you're making an over under judgment rather than saying, I have a laser precision as to what I think the thing is worth. Now you bring up this value versus growth thing. This is really essential, right? Because the key insight in all this is what we want are businesses in general that create value, right? So their the returns are in excess of their opportunity cost to capital, which is, you know, uh, finance 101 or economics 101. <clears throat> and so what we know is if you're earning excess returns, growth is a wonderful thing, right? And the faster you grow, the more wealth you will create. And you could show that mathematically in a very trivial way. Of course, if you're earning below your cost of capital, growth is bad, right? Because the faster you grow, the more wealth you'll destroy. So this notion of value and growth, I think, has always been a false dichotomy. Um, I think we, you know, in, in the factor world, you're talking about sort of proxies for these things. But ultimately, they have to be they have to be connected to one another. And, you know, wealth creation is the key or value creation is the key uh, principle. And so that leads to some very interesting, simple heuristics. Um, you know, so if you have a very high return on capital, high, ex high growth expectation business, very, very modest tweaks downward in the growth rate will lead to very sharp declines in the value of the stock, mathematically appropriately so. Uh, likewise, value stocks, which I think is why they've done well for over long periods of time, tend to be low expectation stocks, right? So that's, that's why they tend to do well. So to me, even I, you know, the value, and I teach at the Graham, as you mentioned, the Columbia Business School Connection, I teach at the Heilbrunn Center for Graham and Dot Investing, right? So very much in this sort of this tradition, but I think the name was chosen very carefully to not be just pure Graham, you know, cigar butt type of thinking. It's really, if, if Graham were around today, how would he think about uh, value investing? And I think he would, he would embrace many of these same ideas. So, so sometimes cheap stocks are cheap for a good reason. Right. And sometimes they're cheap because the expectations are unduly low. So, so it's distinguishing between, between those things that really seems to be the crucial thing. There's a few uh, questions that, that fall out of that for me. When you're thinking about cost of capital, are you calculating that in a traditional uh, efficient markets, uh, looking at the beta of the stock? Or how do you think that the way – how should we be calculating the cost of capital? Yeah. It's a great question. And, and I usually, you know, we've written a bit about this and, and I, I'm completely familiar and to some degree sympathetic to many of the uh, uh, charges against that traditional way of doing it. There are a number of adjustments you can make, for example, using industry betas versus firm specific betas and some things to, you know, just, uh, you know, regression techniques to allow you to think I get to a, a slightly better place. But I also say you, you should triangulate as an, I mean, uh, I, the, the bottom line I always say, I say this to my students in particular, you're a business person, right? So forget about like formulas and filling out formulas. Think about this as a business person and you have a couple things you can do. One is you have, for example, the credit markets, you have bond yields, that should be a touchstone. You have options markets, 
options markets can give you some sense of what's going on. So you have other comparable things. So in other words, there should be ways to triangulate to get into something that's intelligent. And then you want to be just make sure that you're consistent, right? So if it's an expectations game, just that consistency becomes very important. So it should pass. I always say that whatever the cost of capital you come up, it should make business sense. It should make common sense to some degree. And of course, you want to have it tied to some degree to, to, to principles and finance. But the notion of starting building with a risk-free rate and adding some sort of excess risk premium, that, that I mean, that probably does make make sense. But you're right. I mean, uh, so so we've tried to we've tried to get it have it both ways, which is using a traditional asset pricing model, but also saying, uh, understanding that that's not the end all be all and certainly don't do that by rote. I mean, it should be thoughtful and understand the adjustments that will get you closer where you think you should be in terms of uh, the real world. I've, I've tried to understand some of, in some of Buffett's writings, he writes about, he just says, if you reinvest over a period of time and you find that you're trading at a discount to book value, for example, then you're probably, that's an obvious example of where the reinvestment is turning a dollar of earnings into 50 cents or less, you know, less than a dollar of, of retained value and vice versa. Is that, is that an overly simplistic way of going about it? Or do you think that's an effective? I actually, I've actually opened a number of my reports with that basically dollar bill test, right? And that makes some sense. So if you're earning exactly your opportunity cost and you invest in your business, you should be, your dollar should be worth a dollar in the marketplace. And so that's one times book and that does make some sense. And of course, if you're earning high returns, you should be the value of that stream of cash flows then becomes more than a dollar. And as you mentioned, below a dollar should be less than a dollar. So at least as a simple framework, I don't think that's a, a terrible place to start. Now the, the, the devil becomes in the details in terms of how the real world works. And, you know, it's often that even businesses that are valued as, I mean, there are a whole slew of issues with book value to begin with, right? But even simplistically, companies that even are value neutral, value destroying, often trade at a premium to book value, I think, because they have embedded options for restructuring. So it's very tricky to, to, to map that one to one from theory to, to the real world. But I think as a conceptual way to think about it, it absolutely makes uh, sense. Yeah. Uh, as a practical matter, I, I really like the expectations or the implied growth rate style of investing. That's one of the first things that I always look at when I look at the valuation of a company. What sort of growth rate does this company need to achieve, to justify this uh, this stock price? And so an example that's in the news at the moment, and it has been a popular stock for a while, is Chipotle because it was, it was a very high growth rate stock for a while. And then when uh, people got sick, they said it was food poisoning, but I think it was norovirus, which is you can just get very <laughs> unlucky with norovirus. It takes down mm-hmm. cruise ships and things like that. So I thought they were probably a little bit, uh, it was a little bit unfair, but when I went to look at the valuation, it still implied these incredibly high growth rates. And I just, I, kn- I know that Bill Ackman bought it recently and did very well out of it. And I looked at it again today and the implied growth rate is something like 40% compound over the next decade, which which makes it an enormous business. And I think that means that's almost like a Starbucks Chipotle on every corner. So is that, you know, when when you're do you do you look at individual stocks when you're is that is that the way that you th- you recommend folks go about it? Toby, exactly. Um, and I think that. Um, again, I, I always say when you're doing your reverse engineering or understanding the expectations, you should be completely agnostic, right? So really, you should have no view of the world, no view of the business. In particular, you just want to understand what has to happen for this thing to make sense. And so in the example you're giving, right, you're saying these very high growth rates have to transpire for the to justify today's stock price. And then you want to ask the next question, which is what's the likelihood that that will actually occur? And you can do that one of two, day, two ways. One is to do your bottoms up research. And as you said, you know, if it's a restaurant chain, you say how many stores are going to build, what are the economics of the store, so on and so forth. And then the other thing is to appeal to base rates. Just say how many companies of this size have grown at this rate for this period of time in history? And you know that that you know that distribution is going to look like, and you know where this company's growth rate is going to fall in that distribution. And you say, okay, like what what kind of bet do I want to make on that? And we we you know we show we often we use a lot of examples of that. When you're far right tail distribution, you know, so you're you're saying that 40% growth rate it maybe has been done only two or three percent of the time in history. Doesn't mean that it can't happen in this instance, but it probably says suggests to you certainly wouldn't be your base case, right? And, right. and probably should be some some you know you would shade the probabilities to reflect that to some degree. So, so base rates, I think, b- b- you know, your own bottoms up work combined with some sort of base rates to try to inform you. And I would just go back to this notion of uh, you know Graham notion of margin of safety, right? Uh, and if it's close, you shouldn't be playing, right? So if you have to go out four digits on your HP 12C to figure out if it's a good investment, <laughs> it's not a good investment, I can tell you right now. So you really want to find situations where there are a lot of opportunities for upside and ways to make money, presuming you're long, and um, 
and there aren't that many ways to lose. So the sort of asymmetry. So, and, and again, it's a really important thing to say is that almost always the tricky thing is stocks when, when, you know, sentiment's high, you know, sentiment's optimistic, that's when stock prices go up and when sentiment's bearish, right? So you're fighting against a little bit of the broader sentiment and the broader points of view and the consensus view. And that, that's where it becomes psychologically difficult to do this. But the, the discipline of the mathematics of it should be quite straightforward. And, and I think you nailed it exactly how you'd want to think about it. You, when we, we discussed very briefly yesterday when I said I, I, I wanted to discuss a return on invested capital and you sent me through some uh, a 152-page book that you've produced, um, which is base rates across any number of industries. So over the last uh, decade, it's no secret that value has had a very rough run, that more traditional value. And to the extent that any value investors, I think, have succeeded over the last decade, it's because they have been investors who have been um, seeking those higher growth opportunities. And there's some suggestion that um, that the, the market has changed, that for whatever reason, that uh, software really will eat the world. Software as a service is, is going to be the, 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 the dominant business model in many industries. And so that's going to change the base rates do you how do, how do you uh, handle something like that when you've you've got i think the research goes back to 1950 or, or possibly it's it's at least 50 years so you have 50 years of base rates across different sectors and industries and we've got potentially a new uh industry i guess almost because if software is sort of distinct from the underlying industries that it's trying to disrupt how do you get a handle on whether those growth rates are sort of a, a short-term thing, or is it, is it because it's a reasonably new industry? Are growth rates driven by competition? How, or has the world shifted? What's your What's your impression? I mean, this is, uh, I mean, this is obviously really interesting and a very uh, a, a challenging debate. I mean, the first thing I would just say is, and I think you've already made this distinction, but just to re- re-emphasize it, there often when we talk about value versus growth, we're talking about factors. And those are often valuation-based factors, whether it's price to book or price to earnings or something like that. So um, I want to I want to step away from that statistical, you know, definition of value versus growth, and um, revert more to what you described a moment ago, which is like you know, value is buying something for less than what it's worth, right? And, and growth might be, you know, uh, a, a willingness to pay a fuller price for something, or you know, betting on that. So that's the first thing. Um, I, but but I think you're raising I think this whole debate about value versus growth is a really a fundamental one and um, this where this is where doing bottoms up research and understanding what's going on um, can be beneficial so um, there's no question we have a trend which has been going on for decades of investments being more based on intangibles and tangibles and I think that uh, our traditional factor work probably lended itself more to businesses that were more tangible asset based and so then you have to say okay if I'm starting to think about non-rival goods versus rival goods and the economics of information versus the economics of physical goods how do the what are the, what is different about it so no laws of economics have been repealed let's be super clear about that but we've always known we know for a very long time that the economics of information goods are different than those of, of physical goods by the way there's a great book written 20 years ago and notwithstanding some of the examples in the book are, are dated but uh, Carl Shapiro and Hal Varian wrote a book called information rules and I think the information rules has a lot of good models to understand how we should be thinking about these kinds of things. So um, the other issue that you raise, which I think is a very important one, is is the, the, the strengths and limitations of base rates. And like you said, we have data in many cases back to 1950. And you should ask, and it's a very valid question to ask, is whether those those distributions reflect everything that I should think about might happen? And I, the answer would be obviously no, because every time there's a new, <laughs> a new extreme on the left or right hand tail, that's, that's something we'd never seen before. So I would not say that becomes the gospel from which you can never deviate, but rather to say that is something that should um, uh, it, it introduce an element of sobriety, right? To say like, we, we shouldn't expect things to go on for very high rates for very long periods of time. Or at least I don't want to make that bet explicitly. So I think this I think this debate's a really difficult one. I've always tried to reframe, and I've been doing this for many, many years, is reframe the value versus growth thing, just to say it's value creation and uh, buying things for less than the worth are, is a value investor. And you know, I think Munger's got some line like this too, right? He says, you know, 
like all all intelligent investing, value investing, that you buy something for less than what it's worth. And there have been a lot of obviously amazing franchises that were never super cheap. I mean, it would be it would have been really hard to buy Walmart at any point in the first 15 or 20 years that it was public at a, at a valuation you would deem to be cheap, right? Um, it's been very difficult to buy Amazon at any valuation you would deem to be cheap, but those things created enormous amounts of wealth. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm a little bit agnostic, but I think you've, you're raising all the key issues, and I wouldn't be, uh, I would not be tethered to the view that you know value traditional factor value has to come roaring back at some point. Um, you know that said, you know we we've seen these kinds of cycles before, so I I I, have a, I would lean toward even statistical factor value, but but um, yeah, I'm I'm somewhat agnostic on this. I I don't think people should have super strong views one way or another. I think the challenge for the, over the last decade has been that the, that many of these companies have, in in order to justify their their valuation at the time, they have you have had to imagine that the future growth rate is going to be quite high and sustainably high. And then what has transpired is that they ha- they have in fact sustained in many cases these very high rates of return and these very high returns on invested capital. I think Amazon probably is the best example of that because it's. It, I think even a, a decade ago, it would have been very difficult to imagine just how big Amazon is today. And that's because you would have had to have foreseen something like Amazon Web Services, um, which was which was just non-existent. And so I, 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 I would never I would never ask you the question, how do you how do you ever find something like a like an Amazon? But um, do you think that that's something that we should be considering? Should we be moving up our growth rates, or is that the sort of question that everybody asks right at the very top um, of the yeah, market? Yeah, well, I'd be, I would be, resi- I, I would be, I would be hesitant to do that. But I, I do want to. I mean, maybe we can step back and say there's one other aspect to this that I find really interesting, which is, you know, for most of my career, I've lamented that companies have focused too much on growth and not enough on returns, a return on capital in particular. So they've they've allocated capital in such a way that growth becomes the first and foremost thing. And I think there's been a marked difference since the financial crisis in particular. Um, so two things going on. One is I think ROICs in corporate America basically have been going up. And, and part of this is, is the digitization that you described and moving from tangible and tangible assets and so forth. And so um, and that means there's more sensitivity to growth. And so what I what I found interesting is I think that really since the financial crisis and, and the very sort of um, modest recovery in, in the economy globally um, is that growth has become uh, at a premium and people will be willing to pay for this. There's a, there's a weird sort of side story that I've always found very, very intriguing, and that's with mergers and acquisitions. So um, M&A, you know, if you go to business school, um, and even today people say it, although it's not as accurate, um, they would say something like, you know, 60 to 70 percent of M&A deals are value destructive for the acquirer. So we do some cumulative abnormal return around some window. And that that was true for decades. Um, essentially, very hard to create value as an acquirer, right? You, you create value in the aggregate before and there was this really weird thing that for the first seven or eight years coming out of the, of the financial crisis, um, that M&A, the majority of M&A deals created value for the acquirer. And this is completely anomalous if you look at a, at a five-decade history. So I, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I do suspect that this notion of growth uh, being amplified because higher returns on capital – it's become more valuable, so that might be. So you're. So it's an interesting dimension. We should we should demarcate uh, the growth rates uh, and then the returns on capital. So the high returns on capital, the growth becomes a really big amplifier to wealth creation, right? So so that's an interesting thing to throw into that mix, right? Which is like we're looking at these distributions of growth rates historically, but if the ROICs are just a, a shade above the cost of capital, mm, that doesn't amplify all that much. If I then bump up my ROICs, and particularly for some subset of companies, they're much higher, and then I show that right-hand tail growth, then it really amplifies wealth creation, right? So that's a that's a I don't I don't want to be an apologist for anything that's gone on, but I think that may be one at least a set of considerations to look at to try to understand what's happened and um, you know I, I don't think that gets short trips and the M&A thing I think is really we, there's not enough discussion of this it's a really kind of weird it was a weird 10 years following the financial crisis relative to what we'd known for decades and decades 
Is it possible that traditional M and A always you needed to pay a premium price in order to get control? There needed to be a reason to sell, so it always involved some. There was a financial measure, and then there was a takeover premium that was built into it that presumably gave the the, the vendors value for or, or more than value for them in order to let it go. So possibly the prices paid were were lower. But then there's also the other side of the equation too, which is that the cost of capital is lower than it has been traditionally. That's true. And so, um, but there, there are some counter arguments to that, right? One is that the, the observable premiums really aren't materially lower. So I don't think that's the, but that's, that's you know, we could observe that from, from case to case. Um, the cost of capital thing is an interesting one, um, but there are two things. One is the cost of capital, if it's truly lower, that should be reflected in the stock price pre-deal, right? So before you get bid, so that, that price is just higher. So now you could say on the margin, is it cheaper? Um, that's an interesting question. Now, the, 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 the other counterpoint is that, you know, there was a period certainly in 2007, probably in the first part of 2008, where interest rates were relatively low. If you're a borrower, you could borrow at very favorable terms. Not not like today, but not that far off from today. And we we did not have the same phenomenon. In fact, it was actually almost the opposite. That was very difficult to create value as an acquirer. So um, I, don't, I don't really know the answer to this, but it's really, uh, it's just an interesting thing to think about. And uh, you know, I, I always find it interesting that you've had something that becomes sort of uh, conventional wisdom on M&A being value destructor for acquirers. And, and again, it's been taught in business schools for decade after decade. And for this last 10 years, or you know, really, let's say the 10 years or seven, eight years after the financial crisis, for that to be so different is something to, to, to make note of. So I, th- I think the discount rate could be part of it. I do think the premium thing, you know, there are M&A waves. And usually when you act at the beginning of a wave versus the end of the wave, it's more favorable. But I'm not sure any of those things fully, fully explain what we've seen. Just, just to change uh, tack slightly, uh, one of my favorite charts of yours that I've included in a couple of my books and, and possibly three is you, you, you rank all of the uh, companies on their return on invested capital and you have, uh, say, five buckets with the highest return on invested capital uh, after backing out the weighted average cost of capital. And you show over about 10 years that there is this mean reversion in the returns. Right, and I, I've, I had an earlier <laughs> guest on... Uh, uh, who's a business professor in South Africa, and he did a similar examination of South African companies and found almost exactly the same trend, except that he found in South Africa it was more pronounced. It, it occurred in about three years that, that mm-hmm. you know, over a course of three years, the top performers were at the mean and the, the worst performers were at the mean. Could you just talk a little bit about that chart? And I understand that you've updated that over the years, and that, that it seems to have stayed pretty consistent as right. you've done it. Right. It, and it, it will always be consistent, by the way. So um, it, as you just described, what we're doing is, is is documenting regression toward the mean in returns on capital. You could do return on invested capital, ROE, um, and, and our most recent work where you're doing cash flow return on investment. But it's all basically the same story. I, I, I would first, by the way, I would draw people's attention to one of, the, I think, the more interesting chapters in Danny Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is chapter 17. And chapter 17 is all about regression toward the mean. So again, uh, just to be super clear, this is a psychologist writing about regression to the mean in, in somewhat different context, but he makes a point in there that's really important, which is anytime the correlation between two measurements, right? So return on capital today versus return on capital next year, anytime that correlation is less than 1.0, perfect correlation, you're gonna see regression toward the mean, right? So that's the first really important my idea to just to get out there. What, what does that imply just before you go on? Yeah, so so let's 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 think about a world with running we're from a zero correlation to a one correlation right so zero correlation means there's no relationship between uh event one and event two what that means from a practical by the way this, this so so it just says you should expect complete reversion to the mean for the next outcome so let me back up and say what does regression toward the mean say in plain language it says outcomes that are far from average will be followed by outcomes with an expected value closer to the average Outcomes that are far from average will be followed by ex- uh, outcomes with an expected value closer to the average. Now, that correlation coefficient, one versus zero, that tells you the rate at which regression toward the mean happens. So if the correlation is one, there is no regression to the mean at, at all, right? And if the correlation is zero, that means you expect complete regression toward the mean. So, so the first thing to say is, if I say, and by the way, this is really interesting, you show this to a business school student or even a business school professor, and you say you show that chart of high returns going down, low returns going up, 
there's a classic answer for that in microeconomics 101, microeconomics 101, which is competition, right? Toby opens Toby's lemonade stand, very profitable. Michael says, I'm going to come in, build mine right next door to you. Lower price is 10%. Still a good return for me. You have to now lower your prices to match mine and so on. And we iterate down to our opportunity cost of capital, right? Which is fine. And I certainly don't want to deny the notion that, that, that competition happens. But what I'm saying is for any possible set of reasons, not just competition, but it could be sort of any exogenous factors that the correlation ret returns goes down, you will get regression toward the mean. So that's a very, very important message. And again, tying it back to something we talked about a few moments ago, if we're saying that return, the value creation is the key principle and value creation is return on capital, less cost of capital spread, right? So some return. What we're saying is economic, economics are going to drive these returns down over time. So you should be very, very measured about what you're willing to pay for future value creation. So that's, I think that's the main thing. Um, there's another exercise we do that I think freaks people out, which is we actually do regression toward the mean backwards. So we take, for example, you take 2018 numbers and do the same quintile ranking that you just described a moment ago, and then go backward in time and you see the same exact pattern. So while it's very intuitive that competition would affect businesses going forward, it makes no sense that they would affect businesses going backward. And of course, that's what you get. So that's the first principle that's really important for people to understand is that the regression toward the mean is a very uh, a, a powerful thing. It'll happen every time the correlation is less than one. And we can actually measure those correlations and understand the rate of regression to the mean. So it's two, two lessons here. One is that it happens. And second is the rate at which it happens. Now, what we did more recently and I don't know, like the professor in South Africa, like what he did exactly with uh, what industries he selected or whatever it is. But I, I, would have a, I would have an educated guess about that. But what we did then is looked at different sectors. And we could do it, of course, on industry level. And what you find is something that's incredibly intuitive, right, which is sectors like consumer staples have a slower rate of regression toward the mean than sectors such as energy. So saying that differently in plain language, and again, I think very intuitive for most investors, is all things being equal, two companies, a consumer staple company and an energy company with the same return on capital and say roughly equivalent cost of capital, you'd be willing to pay a higher multiple for the staple company than you would for the energy company. Why? Because the staple company will have a more gentle slope back toward the cost of capital and the energy company will have a much steeper one. So um, now what's also important is, you know, we're talking about return on capital regression, and uh, but you, of course, can apply this to anything. You can do it for growth rates and sales. You can do it for margins. You can do it for anything to understand the rate at which that regression toward the mean is likely to happen. So I think it's incredibly powerful. The notion that we can start to measure not just that regression happens, but the rate at which it happens is also incredibly fascinating. It ties back to intuition that you pay less for financials and energy than you do for staples, for example and healthcare, and that's what we see empirically. So, um, yeah, I think it's an incredibly important idea. And, uh, you know, we don't we didn't talk much about this, but, you know, m a lot of people operate with multiples, um, and this is mostly discretionary investors operate with multiples, and multiples are good heuristics, but some of this, these are nuances in the discussion that get lost, I think, when people just bluntly say this is worth 10 times EBITDA or 12 times EBITDA without really understanding uh, what are the underlying economic drivers? So I, I always say to my students, you have to earn the right to use a multiple, which which means that you you know what the underlying economic assumptions are that get you there, and that's um, and that's not always done actually. Can't. I I like using multiples for the simple fact that if you're looking for it just it just stops you from overpaying for most things. There certainly there are some businesses that are worth paying up for, but in the vast majority of cases, if you if you've got a very if you think about the other way around too, if you've got a very high yield, and the and the growth rate implied by that very high yield is very low or negative, then often I think you're finding something that's closer to the bottom of its cycle, mm -hmm. because it's just it's having a very bad run. The, the market is pricing it as if that it continues all the way to zero and. I think the better bet across a portfolio is that there will be some recovery. You're still going to make some mistakes. You're still going to have some blobs. But that is, mm -hmm. that's quantitative factor investing. That's the nature of it. And I 100% agree with that, right? And again, let's rephrase it. It's <clears throat> you're buying low expectations. Right. You're saying you're saying the world is pricing it as if it's going to be worse. It's going to be a little bit better. There are some reasons for us to believe that. And we do a portfolio of these things. Not every one of them is going to work out, but on on balance, it's going to work out very favorably. That's exactly right. In your research, uh, one of the papers that, that uh, you, you wrote 
possibly more than a decade ago, it was death taxes and, and, and mean reversion. I, you, you talk in there about some companies are able to resist mean reversion. I don't know if it was you explicitly said it or if I went in and, and worked it out, but I think it was about 4% of companies in your universe, which might have been the top 1,000 by market cap in that one, which is a very small handful. That's about 40 companies. And I think you, you, you examined the factors. And in, in that one, you looked at, you did a DuPont analysis and you looked at the rate at which capital was turned and the margins and so on. And I think that, I think that my recollection is that you found it difficult to really identify what the drivers were, but you said it tended to be companies with higher margins. And then you looked at the industries and I think you said biotech and pharmaceuticals had tended to do a little bit better and retail had tended to do a little bit worse. Do you have any... Uh, more color on how companies resist mean reversion or what you need to look for? Yeah, I would love to do more work on this, but I will say this, that I would, I would, I would um, direct the attention of our listeners and our viewers to work by Michael Rayner and Mumtaz Ahmed. Do you know this stuff? On, <laughs> no, I don't. Um, okay, so they wrote, I mean, there's, an Harvard, there's a Harvard Business Review article that summarizes their findings, and they wrote a book called The Three Rules. And uh, I think it's chapter two of that book is the sort of the, from my point of view, sort of the money chapter. So they worked with another statistician down at University of Texas named Andy Henderson, and they worked out, um, you know, what they what they try to do is figure out how much of corporate performance was a function of common cause variation versus special cause variation, right? So common cause variation, we'll just say it's the, the randomness in the system. Special cause variation will say some sort of skill, right? So like what, you, what you're just, you know, what we're trying to identify. I should first say, by the way, if you look at investment management industry, the vast majority of what you see out there is explained by common cause variation, right? But we also see in money management that certain money managers do generate, they, they are skillful and they do. Now, the challenge is not that we can't figure that out ex post. The challenge is figuring out ex ante, right? Like, uh, can, can we figure that in advance? So a very similar story is true for companies. And what they did essentially is they created a transition matrix. So they just simply looked at the deciles, I think, at ROA, and then uh, studied empirically how those uh, those transition matrices worked. And then they simulated the world's millions of times and said, does any company defy the simulation? And again, it's a very similar thing. It's a very, it's a, you mentioned, a low single digit percentage of those companies that seem to be We'll call them skillful, whatever you want to say, that are defying essentially that um, that gravity of, of uh, returns. And then they 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 were asking like, what are the factors that are behind that? And they have a, they come up with a couple things. Um, uh, and it turns out so that one of them is better before uh, cost before uh, revenues before cost and better before cheaper. And so they it, the way I would restate that in sort of Michael Porter language is that it seems to me it's a differentiation strategy. And going back to the DuPont thing you alluded to, if you said to me, how would I characterize differentiation versus low cost producer using a DuPont? Differentiation would be high margins, relatively modest capital velocity, getting to your art, and uh, low cost producer would be relatively low margins and high capital velocity. So I, I think that the arrows are pointing toward this, this differentiation, as you pointed out accurately, sort of these high sustaining margins as sort of the key to all this. Now, again, this ex post ex ante question doesn't go away, right? Like, can you identify those kinds of things? And they, so they try to identify or think about or talk about things in the book that would lead you at least to a higher probability of success in identifying these kinds of companies. But they claim that it's, you know, that these rules that they've identified are quite universal. They have nothing to do with industry, whether companies are acquisitive or not acquisitive and so on and so forth. So that that would be to me, and I, I'd love to, we, we actually replicated some of their findings um, and came very close. So so part of that feels very buttoned down, but that's another area of research that I'd love to, to, to do more work on. And um, I, I, th I think it's really fascinating and whether we can actually start to, to take a step toward getting, you know, some things that be predictive to, to allow us to identify those companies. It's striking to see uh, being proven empirically what Buffett has been saying for a long time, which is that brands are very important and that high return on invested capital needs to be supported by some sort of competitive advantage, which he calls a moat. Striking I, to figure I, I, that I will out. say this, though, Toby. This is like this is where I always feel like. Um, so if you had asked me, you know, uh, even before we wrote that piece, but you asked me like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, like what what seems to be the most defensible competitive advantage? 
it's part because I think a lot of our business school case studies are things like Southwest. They're, they're, they're disruptors or like Southwest Airlines or Dell. And what characterizes those businesses typically is lower margins and higher velocity. So I would have I would have sort of like been leaning toward the low cost producer model. But you're exactly right. Folks like and but I think Buffett, you know, that's the, the Buffett slash Munger slash you know, Phil Fisher influence where the better business is, you should pay up a little bit for better business. But it's a really interesting thing. So I feel like I've had to, I've had to sort of shift my own thinking on that a little bit and, and sort of recognize what the data are telling us. But um, that, that I think that there's, there more, more needs to be done, I think. And that's a really fascinating, exciting area for us to, to do more work on. Uh, one of my favorite books of yours is Think Twice, which uh, has, and I, I saw you point this out, and so I, then I, I went back and looked at the cover, and it's right, you have thin ice hidden <laughs> in the title, cleverly. Um, you, you, you talk about inside versus outside views, which I understand to be the difference between the base rate and the case rate. So can you just describe Think Twice, if you would, and, and what you mean by that? Yeah, so Think Twice as a book is the idea that, um, and this really is, the whole thing is almost a homage to Danny Kahneman, right? And this is a system one, system two thinking. So system one's your fast system. It's, it's uh, you know, experiential. It's, it's, it's quick. It's automatic. And then system two is your slower system, analytical, more purposeful, more deliberate, and more costly, candidly. And the, art, the book is trying to run through different situations where you should be uh, recruiting your system two to think through the problem. Um, you know, it's interesting that inside outside view, this is the one idea I think it's so powerful. We've already talked about it, a bit about it, but just to be more formal, and I think you describe it well with case versus base. But inside view is the nat- natural way for us to think about problems. If I pose a problem to you, whether it's, you know, how long will it take you to remodel your kitchen? What will it cost? When will you finish your term paper if you're a beautiful university student? Or, or how will this asset class or the stock perform? The classic way that we all do it is you gather a bunch of information, you combine it with your own experience, your own input and then you forecast and you know for most cases that's perfectly fine the outside view is a markedly different way of looking at the world it says we're going to think about this problem as an instance of a larger reference class base rate and we're going to ask what happened when other people were in this situation before and it's a very unnatural way to think and that's the thing that's why the think twice comes in it's a very unnatural way to think for two reasons one is you have to leave aside all your cherished information right we and we think what's going on in our head is pretty good representation of the world right and you have to you have to discount that which is not a natural thing to do and second is you have to find an appeal to the base rate which is not often at your fingertips so there are many things that are unique to you you may have moved from one city to another and you know it's a new experience for you but many other people have done something like that before so you don't really know what the aggregate experience is like. Um, so the the argument that, and this is a, a famous Kahneman Tversky paper, they talked about this actually in 1973 on the psychology prediction. They said, look, the way to think about a really good prediction is to combine the inside and outside view in an intelligent fashion. And just to follow up, going back to our conversation about regression toward the mean, here's a really simple, I think a really powerful heuristic. If your activity is all luck, no skill, so think about, you know, roulette wheels or lotteries or something. It's all outside view, no inside view. It's all base rates. It does not matter what your prior experience brings to, brings to the table. If it's all skill, no luck, right? So a running race, or I'm sure you're a better tennis player than I am, you know, then it's all inside view, no outside view. So my past tennis record doesn't matter if I'm playing you because you're going to beat me every single time that we play. And then almost, of course, almost everything in life that's interesting is going to be between these two polar extremes. So this is another way for us to think about how do we weight inside versus outside view. It also goes back to our stuff on regression toward the mean. So in a way, these are all sort of intimately connected concepts to some degree. So that's the inside outside view. And I think that notwithstanding, I think many people are starting to understand more about this. Most people don't employ this regularly or systematically. And that's why the base rate book, you saw that was an accumulation of pieces we had trickled out. We put them in one big volume. And, you know, I, I, I would use it as a reference. The first 15 pages or 20 pages I described as regression toward the mean. So I, I, I would say that's a pretty reasonable thing to read. There are a lot of pictures. So it's not that bad. And then the rest of it is just the repository of sort of, uh, you know, specific financial measures for, for companies. And I just think it's an incredibly powerful idea. So this is one where you should, like you said, we, we, we tend to use our own views of things and embed these expectations or growth rates without really thinking like, has anybody ever done this before? You know, is this even plausible? And um, even if it has been done before, it's been done some small percentage of times, you may want to temper the probability you assign to that outcome 
and again, that's again, this being a value investor in the sense of you don't want to overpay for the future, right? You don't want to pay the cheery expectations. Uh, one of the great vignettes in that book is the ba- uh, business magazine covers where the companies that are spoken about in a glowing way tended to have uh, very positive stock price returns in the in the previous three years. And there were, there were companies that were, there were bearish articles written where they had very negative stock price returns over the preceding three to five years, whatever it was. And then, of course, as soon as they publish, <laughs> it flips, which is a very good example of mean reversion, I think, and a little bit reminiscent of the Ibbotson, uh, uh, what does he call it? The the paper or the paper or the book that was that came out recently, the popularity. Exactly. Yeah. Book. Did exactly. you re- read that? I, yeah, I have a I, collection I of those. I did, and it's great. I mean, and I would just say that you know, and Kahneman actually talks about this also in Thinking Fast and Slow. But it's this idea: if you think about extreme positive outcomes, are almost always lots of skill plus lots of luck, and extreme negative outcomes are almost always like not great skill but bad luck. And if you presume that luck is unlikely to be, you know, by definition, it's unlikely to be persistently good or bad, and so, so sort of some sort of distribution, um, then by definition, the guys that are on the covers as being bullish, right, are the ones that have had enjoyed a lot of good luck. And you're, that's why we say the expected value of the next outcome is something closer to the average. You expect the luck on average is going to go, uh, is not going to be as good, and they're going to mean revert. And so, and likewise, the bad companies have had bad luck and they're going to mean revert. So in a sense that, um, that it all also all fits in, right. Is you don't want to extrapolate. Um, and, and, and again, look, all streaks, um, Stephen Jay Gould said, but you know, a streak is great skill plus great luck. It has to be Joe DiMaggio, great skill plus great luck. It, it's the only way you can get there. If you accept that an outcome is some combination of skill and luck, it has to be the combination of the right hand draws from both. They get used to the extreme right hand outcome. So, um, yeah, I think that's a really powerful one. And so again, when everybody's bullish on something, <laughs> you should always like be careful about, uh, uh you know, how, how can things go wrong? Basically. I think that's a really great segue into, uh, my favorite book of yours, which is the success equation, which is in the second shelf in the, in the orange red, just behind <laughs> me there. Uh, there's lots of great ideas in that. I love the idea of, of just trying to understand the role of luck in a lot of the data that you look at too, that the data is not necessarily a pure reflection of skill. So can you just, what, what is the success equation about? You know, it's interesting that I, um, the, one of the latter chapters of Think Twice was about skill and luck. And I originally had it uh, like it's a, as a second chapter because I thought it was really interesting. And my editor reads the book and she says, you know, Ah, this skill luck stuff. I'm not sure anybody's going to really care about this. You you can leave it in, but put it at the end. Right? So I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. So I put it at the end of the book, and then uh, I, you know, some people who, uh, you know, they're friends, and so they would call me up and they go, oh, I really enjoyed Think Twice, and they go, but that chapter on skill and luck that was really cool. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then I wrote one piece when I was at Lake Mason on luck and skill that just seemed to be really resonated with people for whatever reason. So I'm like, all right, I've been emboldened to think about this concept. I also have been influenced by a number of things, um, like many people, uh, Nassim Taleb's book, Fooled by Randomness, which came out in 2001, right around the same time as Expectations Vesting, Michael Lewis's book, Moneyball, so statistical techniques applied to athletics, but you could see how that Moneyball idea is, you know, carried around to different, different domains. And so I thought, you know, Fooled by Randomness is a great message. Um, and being aware that there's a lot more randoms than people think that's great but can we do can we do a little bit better than that can we start to really think about how to how to quantify the contributions of luck in, in various activities so that was sort of the motivating force and and again very much guided by the sports guys but you know the three i i'm i love sports so i, I you know played a lot of sports myself and, and an enthusiastic fan you know, I love the world of business and understand how businesses work and so forth. And of course, investing has really been my professional career. So all three of these things have these very large uh, doses of luck. And so it made a lot of sense for me to try to work on that. So, so yeah, the motivating po- point behind uh, the success equation is to say, can we untangle this co- contribution of skill and luck? And what does this mean for how we think about the world, how we evaluate ourselves, how we judge the, the likelihood of future outcomes? And it's an incredibly rich, not, not to suggest there's, there's much more to be done on this, but it was an incredibly rich, uh, I think, uh, experience just trying to think about that even in a, in a basic way. And, um, yeah, so that's what that, that's what it's like. And, you know, and, and there are basic things like, you know, skill tends to follow an arc, 
almost everywhere you go. You know, athletics is a great example. You get better and better and better. At some point you peak and then you, you degrade. Luck is very weird because some th- some things are like independent draws like coin tosses, but more often luck has to do with social factors. And so these these sort of um, these these uh, path dependent processes and uh, that applies to big, big parts of life as well. So there's I think it's just a fascinating topic. And then uh, rolling up our sleeves, just tying back to all things we talked about, I think it has a lot to say concretely about regression toward the mean. I think I think most investors, if you go to an investor at a conference and you say regression to the mean, you get like a lot of vigorous nods, like affirmative nods. <laughs> but if you actually say like, do you know what this means? I think most people do not understand. I don't think they mean in any way. I don't think they understand what it means exactly. So being able to take it to the next level and, and to put some, some flesh on the bones in terms of, of, of the ideas is really important. One of the really powerful ideas in the book that I had observed uh, in lots of different contexts without ever realizing what it was is the paradox of skill. Mm-hmm. So what is the paradox of skill? Yeah, and, and I should say that I, I think I gave it that name, but I learned it from Stephen Jay Gould, the very eminent uh, evolutionary biologist. And um, he was talking about this in the context of baseball batting averages. But the idea of the paradox of skill is when, uh, when outcomes combine skill and luck, which is most things in life, it can be the case that as skill improves, luck becomes more important in defining the outcome. And that seems like that's the paradox is more skill, but luck is more important. And the key insight is to understand the distinction between absolute skill and relative skill. So absolute skill, and I think we would agree, is you look around the world, it's never been higher, certainly in the world of athletics, and you can do this, especially in, in things measured versus a clock, so swimmers and runners and so forth. I mean, we're, you know, leaving aside some results from performance enhanced, uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're all-time records, business, the world of business, the world of investing. I mean, you, can you imagine if I put you back in the 1960s with the the tools at your fingertips in terms of computing power and data and so forth. You could run laps around your competitors. So absolute skill, I think we all agree, has never been higher. The, but the second point, and this is the point that Gould made, was on relative skill. And uh, what's happened in domain after domain is that relative skill has gotten, uh, has shrunk, which is to say the difference between the very best participant and the average participant is smaller today than it was in years past. So Gould illustrated this with Ted Williams, uh, who was the last player to hit over 400 in Major League Baseball. 1941, he hit 406. And um, so it turns out that this, uh, Ted Williams was almost exactly a four sigma event, four standard deviations. Um, and by the way, batting average itself hasn't changed all that much over the decades. In fact, the, the powers that be in the baseball leagues want to keep it roughly the same um, for competitive. Uh, but we have but we have a, a, a met pun intended, uh, uh, an arms war between pitchers and hitters, right? So, and so, um, so he's a four standard deviation event that got him to 406. If you were a four standard deviation hitter last year, which would be awesome, obviously, you would hit about 380, which is tremendous. You win the batting title and so forth, but you're nowhere near breaching the 400 level. And that's because the standard deviation of batting average, so what that sigma means, that standard deviation means, is less today than it was in years past. So in domain after domain, what you see is this consistency, this this excellence, this consistency of excellence, which means that, uh, that uh, luck becomes more important. So again, Going back to our tennis example, I'm sure that you're a much better tennis player than I am. And I'm I sure confirm that I am not. <laughs> but um, but if we were somehow uh, you know metaphysically identical tennis players, then it really would the outcome of every match would be some sort of coin toss, right? And so it would be complete luck. And what you see in professional sports, by the way, is grinding toward parity. Every league grinds toward parity. Why? Because the quality of the players improves. They're drawing often from global populations, the training techniques, the coaching techniques, the nutrition, and so forth is becoming uniform and uniformly excellent. So as a consequence, you get more parity. Um, and in pro sports, it's really interesting. The, the one area where you don't see much, as much of that is basketball. And basketball is one where superstars really can make a very big difference in that, that they're almost irreplaceable. And it turns out most superstars are men that happen to be 6'7 or 6'8 or 6'9. They're tall. And there aren't that many of those people out there. So it's a really interesting. So, yeah, the paradox of skill. So clearly relevant in the world of investing. One of the charts that we've shown many times, and I, I suspect you've seen it as well, is we just look at the standard deviation of alpha, standard deviation of excess returns. And there are some complicating factors, uh, the fact that the sample size has gotten much bigger and so forth. But basically what you see is a standard deviation of alpha. Standard deviation alpha just comes down, 
what's particularly interesting if you look at mutual funds is it actually comes down 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 and it goes up a lot around the dot coms and then it goes back right back to trend so the dot com introduced with as individuals rushed into the game uh, a lot of opportunities for excess returns for professional investors and then once those uh, you know those essentially those people went away uh, we reverted right back to the big guys uh, fighting each other and the other thing I'll say that, there, you know, there's a really interesting, I, I find this to be um, a little bit surprising, but a lot of people go, well, this fact that everyone's going investing, passive and systematic investing, that's really great for us active managers because that's like those guys are just not. And and the reason I, I hesitate about that is because it, 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 it's the poker table analogy, right? What you want when you're playing poker, if you want to make money, is to have someone who's across the table who's weak, right? So that you can take that person's money. And if that person decides, gee, I'm going to go index, so they essentially leave the table, or, or essentially they're not betting, they may be drinking your beer, but they're not betting anymore, and now you're just completing with the other good card players, your life's got a lot more difficult, not a lot easier. And I think there's some of that that's out there, too. So the people who remain are actually the most skillful, not the least skillful, including mom and pop, who used to be a, a, a fairly important part of the uh, investing ecosystem. Those, they're, they're basically gone, and as a consequence, the big boys are fighting each other, and that just makes it more. I'm so glad you raised uh, poker as an example because that was one of uh, the examples that I was thinking of where there was the, the massive boom in the early 2000s of the online poker where the kids could play 10 tables at one time and so they got this enormous amount of experience in a very quick time so in the, a kid could be in their early 20s and have as much experience as someone who'd been playing for 60, 50 years, someone who'd been playing for a very long period of time but all of these kids had it at the same time so all of a sudden the games were won, the, the, the televised games were won by very young players, but then because they're playing against each other. And this, exactly. is one of, this is one of the really smart things I think that they did. They actually recognized what was happening. And so they would change the way that they played to this very aggressive, loose style, which just increases the amount of luck that you have in the variance, game. Variance, yeah. Want to increase variance, right? And, you know, the other thing that's interesting on all that stuff, just in terms of this spread of excellence, is chess is another fascinating example. So you look at, like, you know, Magnus Carlsen grew up. All right, so so Kasparov lost to Deep Blue in 97. And so I don't know how, I don't know how Magnus Carlsen was. He was probably you know, a little kid, right, five or six years old. And so he grew up in a, a world where he learned not only from a coach, but also by playing online. And so there have been some really interesting things where these guys will track chess moves. And versus the that leading computer programs, and you see that the 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 pro the best players in the world today play more like the programs than their predecessors, which is so cool. So, yeah, I mean these are all ways to get better, you know, and and it just makes the world more competitive. But like you said, it's interesting. And and that there's another that's another idea in the success equation, which is really interesting. Which is if you are if you're the stronger player, you want to reduce variance, right? So you want to make the it's it's make as simple as possible and then overwhelm your competitor with your skill. If you're the weak player, you want to increase variance, right? You just want, you know, so you, you might go down on a ball of flames from time to time, but every now and then you're going to have a strategy that actually works. So, you know, if you're playing you're in a football game or whatever it is, you know, you want to run trick plays. You want to work, run weird stuff that the other team is unlikely to have seen. You're still going to be the underdog, but it gives you a much better chance of success. So whenever you're the weak one, increase variance. So that might be your, that's your poker thing. Like just increase variance. Like that's how you try to, and if I were, if I ever had to play heads up against a poker professional, I would just play with high variance. I would, I would lose most of the time, but every now and then you'd strike goals. Uh, Thanks so much for spending time with us. Uh, just before we go, if, if folks are looking to get in contact with you, what's the best way of doing that? You're on Twitter. Yep, Twitter. Uh, DM on Twitter is great. Um, MichaelMobison.com. So my website has got a bunch of stuff on the different books and so forth, some of the stuff we talked about today. And uh, yeah, I'm, I love to talk to anybody. And, and it was so much fun. I mean, I, I really appreciate that we were able to talk about some some pretty uh, pretty important and serious concepts. I hope I uh, hope, hope it was fun for our listeners as well. Well, I, I had an absolute ball, uh, Michael Mobison. Thank you so much for spending the time with me today. Thank you, Toby. Appreciate it.